Welcome to Secure Freedom Radio. This is Frank Afton, your host and guide for an intelligence briefing on what I think of as the war for the free world. One of the people who has been very thoughtfully contributing to that war for a long time now, uh, from a slightly left of center position, shall we say, in the Brookings Institution, where he is the senior fellow and co-director of the Center for 21st Century Security and Intelligence. He's also the director for research at Brookings. He is Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, you see him in myriad places, in print and on the air. He is active in helping the rest of us understand the challenges that we're facing, not least with his books, the most recent of which is Strategic Reassurance and Resolve, U.S.-China Relations in the 21st Century. Always a welcome guest, and especially for this special hour-long edition of Secure Freedom Radio. Michael O'Hanlon, welcome back. It's good to have you with us, sir. Thank you, Frank. It's great to be with you. Michael, today, of course, uh, we are speaking as the Secretary of Defense is addressing a very important challenge to our national security, namely assuring the deterrence of potential adversaries, uh, many of whom now have uh, not only nuclear forces, but uh, some that are being modernized quite extensively, notably Russia and China. Um, what do you make of what the Secretary of Defense, to the extent we know of his uh, thinking at the moment, uh, what he's up to, what needs to be done to assure the U.S. nuclear deterrent? Well, yeah, thank you, Frank. It's a very important subject that you and I agree. And there's a lot of room for debate about nuclear strategy and modernization in the sense of do we need new types of weapons. But I think we would, you and I at least, would certainly agree there is no room for debate about making sure these weapons stay reliable, safe, totally dependable, uh, and whether one has aspirations of a nuclear-free world uh, like Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama or not, uh, we all know we're nowhere near that world. And in the interim, we're certainly going to have to have a robust deterrent, but also a very safe one. And so it's troubling to see these reports because what these reports suggest is that there are problems with workforce morale, problems with professionalism, problems with maintenance, and these kinds of, of issues should not be ones that we're debating. Uh, and so I really do think that even though we've seen these problems around for a while now, and Secretary Gates, of course, had some issues uh, early on in his tenure several years ago, I think at the very end of the Bush and beginning of the Obama periods with the nuclear weapons uh, organizations within the Air Force, uh, it, it's really regrettable that five years later we're still wrestling with this. So, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is we've got to definitely focus on maintenance, morale, reliability, and safety. Those are just not negotiable issues uh, that anybody should be wavering on. There's so many things that you just said that I want to sort of draw you out on. Uh, one of them is, uh, as you noted, uh, President Reagan had a deep-seated belief that we should try to wean ourselves from nuclear weapons in favor of uh, uh, missile defense. The Strategic Defense Initiative, of course, was uh, one of the things that came out of that uh, conviction. And yet, having worked for him on nuclear forces policy, I can tell you, he was under no illusion that we were anywhere close to the kind of world in which the United States could safely eliminate its nuclear arsenal and indeed probably did more than any other single president to modernize the force and thereby sort of bequeath to us the uh, the nuclear deterrent that we still rely upon. By contrast, Michael, we've got in President Obama, a man who uh, really, I think, is determined to bring about a world without nuclear weapons um, through, among other things, the restraint uh, and, in fact, the dismantling of some of our own nuclear capabilities. And I'd, I'd just like to get your thoughts on what we're looking at now in terms of the sorts of problems that Chuck Hagel is uh, describing today and that I think we agree need to be addressed. Is that in part at least a function of the perception of those in the chain of command that uh, the commander-in-chief really doesn't think much of this mission and is uh, actually uh, trying to undermine it uh, through his various policy initiatives? Well, it's a good question, Frank. You know, when you go back to his famous Prague speech in the spring of 2009, um, that motivated me to, to write a short book. And uh, frankly, I knew I had some issues with some of the nuclear abolition movement, but I wasn't sure at the beginning of the book where I'd come down. And I wound up calling it a skeptic's case 
for nuclear disarmament because I did agree with the goal that which as you know is American policy as codified in the non-proliferation treaty and presidents like Reagan have articulated it that someday it would be nice to have a world without nuclear weapons and what I try to think through is what are the practical things you have to have happen before you can really contemplate that world uh, and uh, to me a few of the issues had to do with First of all, you can't have China still claiming that it might have the right to use force against Taiwan. You can't have most of the Arab states, or many of the Arab states, still rejecting Israel's right to exist. You need a stable U.S.-Russia relationship, which is further away now than when I wrote that book. Uh, and you need, in other words, geopolitics to stabilize in a way that probably is going to take decades. On top of that, you obviously need great progress in verification technology. And even if you ever got to that world, you'd have to assume that it might not last. And you'd have to have a very robust strategy for reconstituting the U.S. deterrent, even if you thought you could get to that world. Now, I realize I'm still probably way left of where you would be on these subjects on some of these questions. We could have a good debate. But my point is, even trying to take a somewhat sympathetic view towards that agenda, I saw many, many serious roadblocks and thought of it in terms of a time horizon of maybe a century. And so, therefore, President Obama's speech in Prague may have been a mistake because it may have sent messages of the type that you're worried that were received. I don't know that President Obama has been uh, derelict in his duties on this front, although the nuclear force uh, reports we're hearing now are, are very troublesome. But I do think he created some false expectations, or at least he took that one speech, a big opportunity, you know, his early speech in Eastern Europe, when he could have talked about a lot of things, and he chose to focus on an issue that unfortunately he wasn't going to be able to make much headway on, and he probably should have known he wasn't going to make much headway. That may contribute to the morale issues uh, within well, the nuclear but, weapons. Mike, let, let me just, again, take, take, uh, take some exception to this, because it does seem to me that what we're witnessing is not just, you know, the sort of residual effects of some words uttered in Prague uh, at the beginning of his presidency, but we're witnessing the cumulative effects of a failure on his part, and, and in fairness, of his predecessors as well, really basically going back to President Reagan, um, to modernize our nuclear deterrent. And we could conceivably agree, uh, at least in a hypothetical sense, that it may take a century to get to a point where the lions have laid down with the lambs and, you know, complete uh, and global disarmament is taking place, which was, as you know, the precondition really for the nuclear, uh, you know, commitments that we'd made to, um, to get rid of our nuclear forces. But Michael, isn't it the case that we're running a real risk if we don't take steps to replace obsolescent nuclear hardware, weaponry, as well as delivery systems, of, of having the world um, be rid of at least our nuclear weapons, if not uh, those of adversaries with whom we must continue to contend. Well, fair points. Uh, although I, I do think there's uh, there's a desirability to separate out the question of modernization, so issues that you and I know well, like earth penetrating weapons, certain kinds of, of space weapons, for example. Some of the kinds of new types of warheads that have sometimes been debated, I think we should have those debates, but we should put them on one side. On the other side are issues where we should not be debating. And I think, again, you and I agree 100% on this, the maintenance of today's nuclear warheads, the ability to be sure they are safe, the ability to be sure that steel doors on silos will open, the ability to make sure you have enough wrenches to install warheads onto ICBMs, the ability to make sure that people in the nuclear weapons establishment know that we value their contribution to the nation's security and they should not waver in their morale or feel like they're getting the wrong message of support. All those issues I think we need to recognize as essential to our national security and it's very troubling uh, as again you and I agree 100% on this point that we're seeing these reports of decline in those areas. So again, it's worthy it, and it's worthwhile to debate the questions of modernization. But what I think we should not be debating, we should all be getting behind, are these issues of maintenance, safety, reliability. And sometimes that does require to go ahead and, and build something new, or maybe it's just a new variant of the same old technology, but you want to make sure it's robust and reliable. Um, but those sorts of things to me are non-controversial, and we really got to get after it. Well, let's explore whether they're controversial or not with uh, a further drill down on this particular point 
as Chuck Hagel is telling us, there are serious problems with our nuclear deterrent posture. Are we doing enough? Uh, Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution and I will discuss that and much more, including the Iranian nuclear threat that is arising right after this. Welcome back. I'm very pleased to say we are visiting for an entire hour with one of the most thoughtful national security practitioners on what I think is the left of our political spectrum. He's a responsible guy on the left, though, let me say. Michael O'Hanlon, a fellow it's always delightful to chat with, and we're having a very interesting conversation, starting with nuclear forces, a topic that doesn't get nearly enough attention, though at the moment it's getting a fair amount from the Secretary of Defense. And Michael, I just want to explore a little further with you this question about maintaining our forces. These nuclear weapons are aging. Uh, they're arguably among the most complex pieces of equipment man has ever devised, those in our arsenal at least. And yet, we haven't tested them realistically. The, the kind of end-to-end -end tests that can only be accomplished with an actual detonation underground since 1992. And there have been a number of changes, as you mentioned, to uh, try to make them a little bit more modern or a little bit more maintainable, at least, less carcinogenic and the like. And yet uh, there's been no effort, as best I can tell, other than sort of computer modeling and some simulations to assure that they really would work. Is that advisable? Is that the kind of maintenance program that you have in mind? Or should we be actually debating the necessity of doing more? It's, it's a fascinating question, Frank. My, just to cut to the chase on my bottom line, I actually do think that as good as our stockpile stewardship program is, as good as our models have become, as good as the people are, although many of them now are in the ranks have never been involved in a nuclear test, as you know, because it's 22 years since we've done one, uh, right. I don't have 100% confidence in, in these sorts of simulations and computations. And therefore, the approach I would take, which is probably a little different than some, or perhaps than yours, but there are a lot of people who support this approach as well, I would introduce to our arsenal one additional type of warhead. Now, it doesn't have to be called a super modern type. I'm not suggesting it necessarily needs new capabilities, but it should be a, a reliable replacement warhead, to use the expression that was, of course, uh, debated and polarizing. And many people on, uh, on my side of the political aisle were against it during the Bush years, and it was not funded but something that essentially employs existing technologies but makes the warhead a little bit more robust that gives right. us at least a, a sort of a fail-safe option. I would favor that. I don't think it would have to be tested, but I do think it should be added to the arsenal as a complement to the other types uh, that are, as you know, much more at the razor's edge of high performance and therefore slightly less dependable as the years go by. Hold the thought, Michael. This is a point we have to pause. We will be right back with more with Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution on Iran and more right after this. We're back. We're joined by Michael O'Hanlon, the author, among other things, of Strategic Reassurance and Resolve, U.S.-China Relations in the 21st Century. And we're going to come to China in a moment, Michael, but um, I, I think on your topic there of having a more reliable warhead in the inventory could make a lot of sense. I must say, though, I am a little bit apprehensive about having one that we introduce without testing it. Um, this is, again, goes back to a, a sort of fundamental proposition that our, our computations, our, our modeling uh, techniques and so on, sufficiently certain that um, we can either rely on old weapons that we haven't tested in 20 odd years or on a, a new one that we haven't tested as well. But let me turn, if I may, to something that may be happening very soon, and that could well be a test of an Iranian nuclear weapon. Uh, the president is very determined, it appears, to secure some kind of deal with the Iranian regime. I believe it will be presented to the American people as one that will prevent the Iranians from getting actually their hands on nuclear weapons. Um, there is a lot of reason to believe, I think, objectively, that that ain't so. Michael O'Hanlon, uh, you know probably as much as any of us about what's shaping up in this deal with the Iranians. It's not finalized. We've got another 10 days or so before it's supposed to be done. But based on what we have been told is coming out of this in terms of enrichment capabilities and not having to dismantle ones and not having to give up uh, uh, low enriched uranium and so on, do you think this agreement will in fact preclude the Iranians from realizing their nuclear weapons ambitions? 
Uh, well, it's a great question, Frank, and as you say, we don't really know everything that's in the deal, but to answer your question the way you put it, which I think is, you were, as usual, very precise with the language, no, I don't think it will preclude it, but what, uh, what I hope it will do, and I'll be looking for every detail to decide whether I support it or not uh, along these lines, what I hope it will do is keep Iran, let's say, a year away from a bomb and make sure that we would have advance notice if Iran started taking the kinds of steps that were required. In other words, keep it a year away and hopefully freeze that delay or that year into a more or less permanent uh, agreement so that Iran would remain a year away indefinitely. And uh, they're going to only do a deal, I believe, if they are allowed to keep some small fraction or modest fraction of their centrifuges. Personally, I could live with that uh, because it might be a better place than we are today. If, if indeed we have robust verification, but you know what I worry about most, and I'm sure you worry about this too, is the ability of the international community to reintroduce biting sanctions if Iran starts to waver in its commitments. And I think that's what a lot of critics on the right are worried about, not only whether we lose the military option in the short term, because that's always there at some level, but whether we lose this carefully constructed international sanctions regime. And by the way, I think it's a bipartisan, bipartisan accomplishment of both President Bush and President Obama and the entire U.S. Congress to have created this structure and to have brought a lot of the world along, uh, which was not easy and took half a decade or more. And the idea that we would risk uh, losing that in order to do a deal is, I think, the most serious consideration that one needs to weigh in assessing what may emerge in the next 10 days or so. Yeah. I, look, I share that uh, that concern, Michael. I, I'm not sure President Obama deserves as much of the credit for that regime as you've suggested, simply because I, I think he fought um, the bipartisan consensus in Congress at just about every turn. But the point is well taken that that regime that was leverage on the Iranians, so no question about it, um, may well be over the side as a result of this deal. But let me just ask you, Michael, because you, you are a very thoughtful guy on these matters. We may not always come to the same conclusion on them, but, but you are thoughtful and careful in your own right. Uh, one of the things that troubles me, before you get to the point of whether the international community will reimpose sanctions, is the question of whether or not we'll know first, how far away the Iranians actually are from getting their hands on nuclear weapons, uh, given the secretiveness of their program, but also whether we'll know that they're in fact violating um, these agreements. Uh, they're not cooperating with the International Atomic Energy Agency. Our own intelligence services have been seemingly largely um, clueless about what's happening, uh, particularly in these underground, hardened, secretive facilities. Uh, but Michael, do you share the concern that um, we may, first of all, not get a year out of this deal uh, in terms of lead time? And second of all, we may not know uh, that they've moved very, very dramatically closer to having the bomb, indeed may even have it. Well, I think the greatest worry, Frank, is about sites that we don't know about, because I do believe that we will be in a pretty robust position, if, if the negotiators are doing their jobs, to at least be able to verify uh, the sites that Iran has already established. And as you, I think you were alluding to the fact that, of course, Iran did not identify all those sites originally, which right. is part, part of why we internationally, you know, as a community, consider them to be essentially a, you know, more or less not a good citizen of the nuclear non-proliferation regime, to put it mildly, and yeah. th therefore they can't be trusted in the future, except to, you know, in fact, Ronald Reagan's line of trust but verify, you probably wouldn't even want to use the word trust with the Iranians. You better just simply verify. Uh, right. But even if we can do that at the sites we know about, just as in the North Korea case a few years ago, we have to worry about sites that we don't know about. Now, of course, that's a challenge for anybody with any option towards Iran, because, for example, if you were trying to bomb their nuclear facilities, you couldn't hit targets you didn't know about either. So this is, unfortunately, a challenge to any policy option that I can think of, but that is where my greatest uncertainty would lie. Yeah, I, I, I very much concur with that. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon, we have to pause for just a moment. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about, well, yet another nuclear threat to the United States, and, and in fact a menace to just about all of the free world, notably at the moment Ukraine, and that is Vladimir Putin's Russia. Michael O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institution, our guest for this special edition of Secure Freedom Radio. That and more, straight ahead. <laughs> 
We're back. Special edition of Secure Freedom Radio with Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution. Michael is an author of numerous, very thoughtful, um, very, I think, consequential books, uh, countless op-ed articles, and of course, regularly seen at NBC and elsewhere, um, commenting on the national security issues of our day. His most recent book, and a topic we'll be turning to momentarily, is Strategic Reassurance and Resolve. U.S.-China relations in the 21st century. Michael, um, before we get to China, I want to talk to uh, one of their friends and one of uh, the nations that, as you said earlier, um, has become increasingly problematic for the United States, namely Russia. Um, there are reports, and I think they're not just from the Ukrainian government at this point. I think that uh, General Philip Breedlove of um, the NATO Supreme Commander has uh, confirmed them, that the Russians seem to be putting in weapons, um, including tanks, uh, columns of tanks for that matter, into eastern Ukraine at this moment. Um, do you credit those reports and what do you make of them, uh, especially against the backdrop that uh, Putin was supposedly conforming to a ceasefire agreement with the Ukrainians uh, recently concluded? Well, first of all, I'm troubled by them too. Second, I have no reason to doubt them, unfortunately. I wish I, I did, but it does sound like there are multiple sources that have proven themselves correct in the last year and watching this crisis previously. Uh, third, my guess is that Putin's going to be a guy who we have to worry about for the entire time he's in his presidency. You know, it's going to be, it may not be a new Cold War, but it's going to be a new requirement for a significant American vigilance because I think he's intent on probing, exploring weakness. And I'm even worried, and I, you probably are too, Frank, but I let you speak for yourself. I'm even worried about whether he would try to probe into the territories of NATO allies, mm -hmm. especially the three Baltic states, because, of course, they were part of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And he would love nothing more than to reveal NATO to be a paper tiger in defense of its own allies. And right. so I'm looking even down the road to that scenario. but. Uh, and it's one of the scenarios I'm looking at in a book I'm writing now on the future of land warfare and how to think about the future of the U.S. Army and what it needs to be able to do around the world. But specifically on the Ukraine crisis, as you mentioned, my guess is that what Putin's up to is trying to create the conditions for these so-called frozen conflicts, although they're anything but frozen at the moment, uh, where he essentially has coercive power over an entire country, in this case Ukraine, because he's essentially occupying or his proxies are occupying part of that country's territory with the implied threat that he could do more. And I think he would like to lock that in. So what I'm assuming is that, you know, and he'll deny it, and he'll say it's volunteers from the Russian military and such nonsense, but it's clearly a matter of Russian state policy. And then the question becomes, what is our response? And I think the only realistic response here, well, there are two main areas to, to think about. One is of course, the economic sanctions that we apply with our allies and think about how to intensify those and hopefully give Putin a so-called off-ramp so that if he behaves better, he knows that he can have the sanctions at some point uh, lifted or at least relaxed. But then the other issue is, of course, how do we help the Ukrainian military strengthen itself uh, through arms transfers? I do not favor, uh, I categorically do not favor a American or NATO military response directly over Ukraine. But I do think we have to consider very seriously helping the Ukrainian military beef up its own capability. I would suggest to Poroshenko, however, the president of Ukraine, that he not actually look for a confrontation with Russia, because I don't think he can win that. Uh, so the beefing up is more of a deterrent against future and further Russian aggression on Ukrainian soil than a direct ability to uh, liberate those areas that Russian separatists and Russian forces themselves now control. I think you have to rely on the economic lever to try to create that liberation. Yeah, Michael O'Hanlon, you, you've, as usual, uh, packaged a lot of information in that response. L let me tease out a couple of pieces of it. One is, um, I th very much agree. I think that uh, this is uh, like the proverbial case of, uh, you know, the burglar in the hotel, I think was the way uh, Churchill described Stalin, uh, checking all the doors and going into one if it finds it unlocked, um, where Putin will push and push and push as much as he can, notably 
as you say, in the Baltics, where to varying degrees you have Russian populations that a uh, similar kind of gambit could be manufactured uh, to justify Russian intervention on behalf of uh, the Russian um, ethnic or, or language-based uh, populations there. Should the United States, in your estimation, Michael O'Hanlon, be putting military forces into those NATO states to create what has in the past been considered kind of a tripwire um, to preclude, or better yet, at least to dissuade the Russians from probing, uh, trying to break through that particular door? I think we might have to do that soon, Frank. Uh, the only thing I'm wrestling with is whether I favor doing it at this minute. I think we need to show Moscow that we're very seriously considering it, though. And therefore, I would initiate sort of formal NATO studies. And I might even be willing to act on them very, very soon. For example, I, I like the way you, you express it as a tripwire force, because I think there's a way here to make sure that our commitment is unambiguous without giving any kind of, uh, of support to these Russian conspiracy theories that somehow we're intent on putting up our military forces in a threatening posture vis-a-vis -vis their country. In other words, I would use primarily light infantry, and I wouldn't have a lot of it, but I would have enough that it's more than just the occasional exercise or rotation. And I think that's the right way to think about, you know, roughly, let's say, a, a brigade or so of American capability, and then maybe a brigade or two of other NATO forces being there as well with us. Michael Hen, let me just ask you the the pointed question. You aren't sure that you would do it now. You think we might need to do it soon. What precisely would be the circumstances under which you'd say it's time to put American forces in some number on the ground in, let's say, the Baltic states? Well, as I say, I'm quite close, Frank. I guess as I think this through, what I'd like to do is essentially do the formal planning as the shot across the bow and essentially say to Putin, we're very close to this. If this is what you want, fine. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's actually not a big deal. It's a tripwire force. It's a reassurance force for our allies. It's not meant to be a threat against you. We're not going to apologize if we do it. Um, and maybe I would do that study quickly. And maybe if he kept moving these tanks into eastern Ukraine within a couple of weeks or a month, I'm just suggesting there might be a benefit to a two-stage process where you first announce the formal planning. And then fairly soon thereafter, you go ahead and make the decision. I'm pretty close. If I were he, I would begin ratcheting up that problem in uh, in the Baltic states right quick. If we were to take that step, but we'll we'll see. We'll see if your advice is taken. We'll see if uh, he proceeds into Ukraine, as I think he will. Uh, Michael, let me just ask you in relation to that question of the extent to which we might be able to put uh, a brigade strength unit into uh, one or more of these Baltic states. I I'm reminded of uh, General Ray Ordierno's comment recently, uh, the Chief of Staff of the United States Army, as you know, and you're writing a book on the subject of the United States Army, so I'm certain that this is top of your mind as well. He, he said, as I recall, that he had two brigades that were combat ready uh, at that time, which was uh, earlier this year. I, I'm not sure if the circumstances have improved. What do you make of the condition of the United States military, as well as, you know, kind of your thoughts on what it should be, uh, the Army specifically, but the military more generally, uh, capable of doing in the future? Well, I think we have some serious concerns about the pace at which we're now downsizing the Army, and especially the possibility of sequestration returning next year in the defense budget. Yeah. I'm in favor myself of not only eliminating sequestration, but at least of having a modest real increase in the projected defense budget. Um, and I think that would allow us to keep, I'm, I'm comfortable with an active duty army in the range of 450,000, um, which is a little less than we have now, but substantially more than we would have under sequestration. But I think it's worth noting, and I realize there are other people who would prefer that number be a little bigger. Uh, there was, as you know, this independent panel this year, the National Defense Panel, that Eric Edelman and Michelle Flournoy, two former undersecretaries of defense for two different political parties, uh, co-authored. And they basically said, listen, the world's at least as dangerous as the 1990s, so we should at least have an army of the size of the 1990s, which frankly is, is bigger than we're headed for. It's yeah. about the size we got now. It's Considerably. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think my, my point is, I know I'm throwing a lot of detail into this, my point is in broad terms, I agree with your concern, and certainly under sequestration, we'd have to cut the army way too much for my comfort. Yeah, well, we look 
forward to working with you and trying to get sequestration pushed over the side, Michael O'Hanlon, because I think your voice on the left would be very important to helping persuade some in your party to be uh, more responsible, and I'm sure anxious to help some in ours uh, do the same. We're going to pause for just a second. When we come back, we're going to visit at last with Michael O'Hanlon in our final segment of this special edition with him about China. Uh, the pivot that the president announced some time ago, how his trip now underway in the region is being seen by the Chinese, and what are the prospects that we will find ourselves facing a very formidable competitor in communist China in the days ahead. That and more with Michael O'Hanlon, straight ahead. Welcome back to Secure Freedom Radio with Michael O'Hanlon of the Brookings Institution. He is its highly regarded director of research and also runs its program on security and intelligence in the 21st century. And Michael, thank you so much for taking this time with us. It's it's always illuminating and uh, this conversation is fully measured up, but I want to turn from the topics that we've addressed with you so far to one that, um, as I've mentioned several times, you've written about most recently in one of your books entitled Strategic Reassurance and Resolve, U.S.-China Relations in the 21st Century. President Obama, of course, has been uh, for much of this week in Asia, including in China. He's announced a couple of deals with the Chinese. Um, several of them have uh, some bearing on national security. And I wonder what you make of the current state of the U.S.-Chinese relationship and whether the pivot that the president had uh, promised is, in fact, a thing of the past or is likely to have any bearing on those relations in the future. Well, on the state of the relationship, Frank, I think uh, Jim Steinberg and I wrote that book because we're worried about it. And, you know, as, as you and I are aware, we've got friends in the academic world who make two competing arguments. Uh, some people say it's inevitable there's going to be a bad rivalry or worse because we've got the established superpower of the United States and the rising power of China. And whenever this has happened historically, especially countries of different political systems, uh, there's an inevitability of conflict. Then there's those, uh, our group that say, no, don't worry, uh, we trade so much, we're all enlightened these days, it's the 21st century after all, and things will be just fine. And Jim and I are not in either camp. We are not deterministic. We don't think this is preordained, that it has to go one way or the other. But obviously the U.S. has a lot of interests and allies in the Western Pacific, which is exactly where China seems to want to exert greater influence. So there is the potential for serious, uh, you know, showdowns and, and dangers. If, um, if things go in a certain direction and China continues to feel its oats as it rises and increases its defense spending and capability. So I'm worried. Um, I, I think there's a lot to work with that is hopeful, but the book was written out of a sense of concern, and, uh, and that's the starting point. On the recent accords, they actually, I'm not suggesting that Jim and I had any great influence, but they are very much in, in concert with what we advocate, but they're two relatively modest pieces of the kind of agenda he and I believe we need to pursue. So as you know, one of them is essentially a hotline agreement between the militaries, and then one of them is essentially an incidence at sea and an air uh, agreement where hopefully the Chinese will take this seriously and stop sailing ships and you know flying airplanes right in front of our assets in dangerous ways in those waters. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more to do as well, but that I think that was a set of relatively encouraging but relatively modest steps this week in Beijing. But I want to get at the question that I think is uh, probably nagging for most of us, and I, I suspect for you and for James, um, that is, uh, we have to be concerned about such Chinese, well, belligerent behavior, primarily because they've declared that almost all of the South China Sea, as you know, Michael O'Hanlon, to be their territorial waters. They've created air defense um, intercept zones uh, that are basically uh, very extensive and, and encroaching on the airspace of other nations, including some of our friends. And I, I just, I'm wondering whether you might agree with an analysis that I heard from uh, one of our previous guests, Rick Fisher, this week. Um, he thinks that the Chinese actually have kind of a threefold strategy that's developing. The first is uh, underway at the moment, domination of Asia and uh, the Western Pacific. Uh, in a second phase, probably out uh, maybe six, seven, ten years, dominating or at least being able to project power globally. And then thirdly, um, perhaps uh, evolving roughly at the same time as that second phase, but uh, growing over time, 
dominating what he calls the, uh, or I think they call the Earth Moon domain. Um, what are your senses of, of where the Chinese are headed, and can conflict really, as a practical matter, be avoided if they have those ambitions? Well, Rick's a smart guy, and so anything he says, I, I want to think more about and take seriously. But you know, even if even if one can debate his third point, I think that the first one is obvious and reason enough for concern. Their ambitions yeah. in their own neighborhood, and the second one is logical from at least the Chinese point of view. They depend on Persian Gulf oil and other assets around the world that right now they can't protect, and that we could frankly cut off if we chose to. And therefore, you have to assume that down the road they are going to want to have the ability to go head to head with us in some of those regions. So I guess I'm with him on uh, probably two of the three and say I'm agnostic on the third and I'm not sure the disagreement's even that important uh, in terms of both of us being vigilant and concerned about the relationship in the near term. Uh, you mentioned the pivot earlier or the rebalance. By the way, I've always thought the term pivot, even though the administration uses both as you know, the term pivot is somewhat too ambitious in one sense and somewhat unnecessary. Unfortunately, we can't seem to get ourselves out of the quicksand of the Middle East, no matter who's in the White House and how much we try. So the idea that we can pivot to Asia is both um, a, l a little unfortunate in that it doesn't give our allies in other parts of the world sufficient due, but also unrealistic in that we're not going to get out of the Middle East and we shouldn't pretend we will. But even the rebalance, even a slightly less ambitious form, uh, requires at least um, some things happening that are in jeopardy because of the defense budget trends that you and I have previously discussed. And right. uh, by the way, on the diplomatic side, I'm very happy that President Obama is in the region this week. That's exactly the kind of thing we need to continue. I think Secretary Hagel's done an okay job on that front, but fairly quietly. I think Secretary Kerry's had so much going on in the Middle East and in Ukraine and right. Russia. And that's sort of where his instincts and his interests have always probably been greater anyway that uh, I do worry a little that he is not quite as focused on East Asia as, as we might need him to be. Yeah. My good friend Susan Rice, I think, is trying her best and doing some good things and giving some good speeches, but in the absence of um, sufficient attention from uh, the cabinet itself and the president, it's hard uh, for the working level uh, to, to accomplish this. So uh, I'm glad for the president's visit, but I'm worried about the defense budget trends. And we can talk more about the specific naval requirements of the rebalance if you wish. But I would say right now we're teetering on the edge of losing a lot of the oomph behind the rebalance. Yeah. Again, it goes back to kind of what we were talking about earlier, Michael, with respect to the president's stated policies with respect to uh, nuclear deterrence and the kinds of things that flow from his rhetoric, uh, both in terms of um, impinging upon our investments for one thing, and perhaps uh, the impact that we're having on the perceptions of both friends and foes alike. And I'm afraid that the loose talk about the pivot, particularly without the requisite resources being applied to it, is is probably having a deleterious effect on, on all of those categories. But let me, let me turn to one last area, because we're almost out of time, and um, there's so much to talk with you about. But I would like to get your perspective as a serious national security professional, Michael O'Hanlon, on the left, uh, about what's happening with respect to our border, uh, the southern border specifically, and the president's determination to apparently on the basis of uh, some executive authority he didn't think he had until recently, but now is prepared to exercise, I think unconstitutionally, by the way, to extended amnesty to millions and millions of people in this country illegally, the implication being that if the border is not secure, and it certainly doesn't seem to be at the moment, that it will serve this amnesty as a magnet for still more to come across. What are your thoughts on those issues, Michael O'Hanlon? Well, you you finished it up with a tough one, Frank, because it's an issue that I have to concede that it's not in my uh, normal area of, of emphasis uh, in my job, but you're, you're right to raise it because it's obviously important. And, well, and, uh, and a national security issue, among other things, I think. Indeed. indeed. And, and so I guess I would answer it in this way, and I, I don't really want to put all the blame, I'm not suggesting you were yourself, but I don't want to put all the blame on the president. I, I would like to put a little bit of the blame on Washington, the way Washington's been working. This issue is the kind of thing that I, I believe is too important 
to try to resolve through an executive order because it's, a, it's an issue where we need to develop at least the semblance of a national consensus. Yeah. And I understand okay. President Obama's frustration. He feels like he's been trying and not gotten help from across the aisle. Well, you know, we're six years into his presidency. Um, even if he's been right uh, in his approach, uh, or at least trying to be, um, you know, trying to be open-minded and trying to reach out, it hasn't worked. We're six years in. Maybe it's time to let the 2016 presidential race focus square on on this issue yeah. and recognize that this particular series of Congresses and this particular president aren't going to be able to get the job done. And if we waited six years, we can wait two more. Michael Hunt, let me turn to one other topic. And I know this isn't really directly in your wheelhouse necessarily, though in some areas it has had some bearing on national security. But Jonathan Turley, um, the professor of law at George Washington University and very much a man of the left, has expressed concerns, and I just wonder whether you share them, about a practice that I think is now very much a hallmark of the Obama administration. Um, I think he's called it presidential lawlessness. Do you feel, as a man committed to our Republican form of government, I mean, small r, Republican form of government, that uh, the kinds of checks and balances the Constitution has on an executive authority are, are being dispensed with or otherwise put in jeopardy by the kind of decisions the president's been making by fiat? You know, Frank, uh, even though uh, I just gave an answer where I ex expressed a preference that he not try to deal with the immigration problem in this kind of a way, I'm not sure I see this as a problem, from my perspective at least, that is uh, special to President Obama. I think on issues of the use of force, as you know, we have some constitutional challenges that are very difficult. And people who are senators and then become presidents, whoever they may be, tend to wind up shifting their perspective when they shift from one end of Pennsylvania Avenue to the other. And the current incumbent in the White House is no exception. Um, and I, but I think, you know, on the issues of the use of military force, I'm actually, in this particular case, and I'm, so now I'm taking a tangent off your question, I'm actually more worried about the flip side of the problem, which is that in the interest of undoing a law that President Bush signed that President Obama never liked when he was a senator, the authorization on the use of military force after 9-11, that President Obama is going to create an unnecessary complication in his current ability to go after ISIS by asking the Congress to give him a modified version of an AUMF that in fact would restrict his ability to properly go after ISIS in Iraq and Syria. So if you don't mind, I'm going to take that tangent on your question and just actually say at the moment, my concern is more in the other direction. And I would encourage President Obama to use that law that President Bush signed uh, to properly go after ISIS, which is a severe enough threat uh, that my first worry here is about going after that threat without any uh, arbitrary limits on the duration of an operation or how many Americans can be involved in it. I understand. Michael O'Hanlon, as always, a thoughtful answer to a hard question. Thank you again for joining us and for your insights. Uh, keep up the good work. We'll talk with you again very soon. Welcome back. We're visiting with Tom Trento. Uh, you know him best as the star of Enemies of the State here at 740 WSBR in sunny Boca Raton. He's in sunny Israel at the moment, uh, though the sun is not um, perhaps shining as brightly on the Jewish state as it might otherwise be because of some very perilous times that the uh, Jewish people in Israel are going through. Tom Trento, we're very anxious to get your on-the-scene report. Tell us what you make of what's happening there at the moment. Yeah, Frank, uh, the, the sun in the sky has been shining brightly. It's 85 degrees every day. Uh, on the beaches in, uh, in Israel and the Tel Aviv and other beaches, you think it's Miami Beach, but indeed there's some difficulty going on um, as a result of the defeat that the Hamas took in Operation Protective Edge and as a result of the fractions between the PA, the Palestinian Authority, and the Hamas, uh, Abu Mazen, that's Mahmoud Abbas, they call him Abu Mazen here, has stirred up a lot of the young jihadis, and there's been some independent uh, terrorist attacks also stirred up by the Islamic State. But the uh, the state officials here in Israel, the Jewish border police, the uh, the Israeli IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, and the Israeli regular police are uh, well in control of the situation. Um, and people are going about their everyday business. The Israelis are used to this, and uh, it's going to be temporary. Uh, but I've done a lot of reconnaissance, particularly for the trip uh, that'll be taking place in uh, March 2015. 
Uh, Tom, some people are calling what's taking place there at the moment uh, a new intifada, uh, an, an uprising uh, with, you know, random acts of violence being perpetrated by uh, some of these jihadis, as you say, inspired not just by Hamas, uh, but by the Palestinian Authority itself, the supposed good guys. What does this mean that we're seeing these kinds of acts of terrorism? Uh, is it something that can be prevented? Or is it something that we're likely to see more of uh, before it's done? Uh, I think I think Israel is going to see more of this. The Palestinians, not, not the Gazans so much. That's, that's an area of terrorism. But in Judea, Samaria, I was in the West Bank uh, for a whole day the other day in Arab communities. I was in a... Uh, an industrial plant that makes plastics, 50 Palestinians working with 40 Jews, Palestinian managers overseeing Israelis, everybody working together. Because it's an open society, there's more opportunity for bad guys to exploit those scenes. Those scenes are being exploited now with some independent terrorism, I believe inspired by the Islamic State, by their new magazine, Dabiq, which is uh, talking about using vehicles and being inspired by Joseph Guardari calling for an uprising. Indeed, some in the Palestinian Authority are calling for that. Uh, so there is talk of a, of a third or a silent intifada going on. And it uh, depends on how you evaluate what an intifada is, an uprising. But they're really cracking down. They're talking about a curfew right now, the Israelis, and they're talking about destroying the homes of the terrorists that they catch. Tom, I have to ask you um, a hard question here. To what extent do you think what's taking place in Israel today, uh, whether it's inspired by the Islamic State or by Abu Mazen or by uh, Hamas or uh, by any other the Muslim Brotherhood, any other part of the global jihadist enterprise, uh, is nonetheless at least being encouraged, um, if not actually uh, enabled, by the kinds of divisions that we're seeing between the Obama administration and the government of Israel at the moment. Uh, there, there's, there's absolutely no question that the vacillation and if the average Israeli, when you talk to the average Israeli on the uh, they, they understand there's a disdain for Israel coming out of the State Department and the administration. Conversely, the Palestinian Authority and the Hamas see that disdain and that hatred from Obama to Israel as an opportunity. They see that as a green light, knowing that the United States is not going to crack down on Israel uh, the United States will crack down on Israel if Israel gets too tough on the terrorists. So without question, Obama's weakness is fueling the activity of the jihadists in Israel. And every Israeli understands that. Yeah, I wish it were just weakness, Tom. My sense of it is that it's a, a deliberate effort to estrange the United States from Israel. And uh, I'm afraid that enemies of both the Jewish state and the United States are reading it correctly, and I fear that there will be more trouble ahead for both of our countries. Tom, we appreciate your reporting from the front lines of what I call the war for the free world. Uh, stay safe there, and uh, please give the people of Israel our very best. Uh, we'll look forward to having you back next week. Will do. Take care now.